Hello and welcome to College Physics 2, Lecture 9, Calculating Electric Potential. This is the third in our three-part lectures on electric potential. In our last lecture, we looked at conservation of energy and how that applies to these situations. Here, our goal is to learn how to figure out the potential in a region of space. We'll start by looking at the potential in the space between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor and then we will take a look at how to calculate potential for point charges just in random space. To begin, I just wanted to recap our waterfall analogy from the previous lecture because it is important and I will make a reference to it here in this discussion. So going all the way back to physics one concepts, think of this waterfall where we have a water molecule at the top falling down the waterfall. Well, as this molecule moves down the waterfall, it's losing potential energy, right? Because is when it's up high, it has a lot of gravitational potential energy, and then it's moving closer and closer to the ground where that potential energy is lower. But energy is conserved. It has to go somewhere. So as it loses that uh, potential energy, it is gaining kinetic energy, the energy of motion. In other words, it picks up speed. And... We know this because of gravity, things that are falling pick up speed, right? They accelerate. So this exact same idea applies to charges in electric fields. Here we have an electric field as the waterfall and a positive charge as our water molecule. The exact same discussion applies. The electric field points downward from high to low potential. And so as the charge moves downward with it, it is losing potential energy but gaining kinetic energy. So anytime, you know, you get kind of mixed up with these energies and, you know, discussions of electric fields and electric potential energy, think of this waterfall analogy. I believe it can be very useful. So let's take this now and apply it to the parallel plate capacitor. Consider a parallel plate capacitor where you have a separation D between the plates as shown in the image and each plate is charged with some amount of charge Q. One's positive, of course, and one is negative. Well, we learned previously that these devices, parallel plate capacitors, generate electric fields in between their two plates that are uniform, right? It is a uniform electric field. So in this case, what we can realize is that um, we have an equation for this electric field that we introduced, right? Q over epsilon naught A. Well, it also produces an electric potential, as we've now learned. So not only is there an electric field at all points in between the plates, but there's also this potential. So we want to describe this. This is all us planning and getting things set up. First, realize that we can define zero to be wherever we want. In physics one, we said the ground was our zero level, and anytime you raised an object off the ground, you're lifting it up above your zero point. Well, we can do the same thing here. We can say the negative plate is our zero point, just like the ground was in physics one. So that any distance we move a charge away from zero, we can measure that, right? Measure that distance. And so this is kind of the discussion moving forward. Just like lifting an object up off the surface where we have said x was equal to zero, or in that case, y was equal to zero, we can think of it in the case of a charge being moved away from zero. So we always define, again, by definition, the negative plate to be our zero position. But that's not all we can define to be zero there. We can also say that our electric potential energy there is also zero at the negative plate. And this goes back to our waterfall analogy, right? Right here at the bottom, once the water molecule moves all the way down to the bottom, it doesn't have any uh, potential energy anymore because it's down at the surface. Its potential energy is now zero. Well, the same thing is true here now. We're saying at the negative plate, that is where the potential energy is equal to zero. So this is just the waterfall analogy, just, I guess, technically turned sideways. So now let's consider what happens though. If we take some charge, say this positive charge that's shown, and put it some random distance in between the plates that we call x. 
So be careful, this does get a little confusing now. We're saying D is the distance between the plates, but X is the location where our charge is in that space. So let's just say we, we move some charge to this distance X between the plates. Well, the potential energy is the amount of work done um, by a force to move it to that position, right? So we learned from physics one, the equation for work. We saw that work was equal to force times displacement. If you don't recall that, that's fine. It's just us pulling in material from the past. You can go back and watch a physics one lecture that I recorded if you'd like. But we saw that work was equal to force times displacement. Well, in this case, the force that we're talking about is the electric force that we introduced in these lectures. So when we write force, F, what we're really going to be plugging in is Q times E, the electric force. All right, so we're going to take our F equals QE here and plug it in for F. So that if we want to know how much work is being done, we can say that it's equal to QEX. So this is still us just preparing. We're just building up toward our important equation. But at least we now have an understanding of what's happening, right? We're seeing that we come in here with our hand and physically do work to push this charge to some distance x. And that's based on how strong the electric field is and how far you move it, x. OK. Well, we also saw that there's the work energy equation, right? By definition, uh, the amount of work that you do is equal to your change in energy. I think I put the delta in the wrong symbol, but in the wrong place. But the idea is that your work is going to be equal to the amount of energy change. I believe it should be delta here. Work is equal to your change in your energy. Um, but in this case, your energy is just zero at the negative plate. So there's really no net, no necessary, I guess, requirement to have a delta symbol at all. Um, because one of them is just equal to zero. The general idea here is that if you want to figure out your electric potential energy of that charge Q, it's simply equal to the work that you do to move it there. So not only is your work equal to QEX, but so is your electric potential energy. Okay. So again, that's our work energy equation. The, the general form of that equation from the past was that uh, work was equal to the change in the energy of the system, where the energy that we're talking about here just happens to be uh, our potential energy. So with all this in mind, we can finally get to the goal of this lecture, calculating potential. We also have an equation that says potential V is equal to our potential energy divided by Q. So we have an equation, potential energy is QEX, right? And then we divide that by Q. So the Q's here will cancel out, leaving behind simply E times X. But E is just a general symbol for electric field. We're talking about the electric field of a very specific device, a parallel plate capacitor. And from the previous slide, two slides ago, we had this equation here. Electric field of a parallel plate capacitor is Q divided by epsilon naught A. So we can plug that into the equation and get the final form of the potential in between two plates of a parallel plate capacitor. Q over epsilon naught A times X. So I understand that there's a lot of different symbols and equations that we've just used. Be aware that most of this was just us deriving this final equation that I have shown in green at the bottom. So this was really us just building up, combining equations, introducing new ones, getting them ready to talk about that final form. But this equation does describe to you the potential at some point in space between your capacitor plates. There is kind of a simpler version of it. So we know that based on that equation, the electric field is going to increase linearly. So it's just a gradual increase from one plate to the next. Uh, and so if we wanted to figure out the potential difference between the two plates or use that information to help us, well, that makes things a little bit more easy. We just saw that the general form of the equation on the last slide was V equals E 
times x. Well, if we want to figure out the potential difference, in other words, your change in potential, well, in this case, we just have e times d instead. Right, because uh, d is the full separation between the two plates. So if you're looking for the difference between the two plates, you look at the difference in distance between the two, which would be zero at the negative plate and d at the positive plate. And so then just rearranging that is how we get to this equation here. I use the subscript c here just to denote that this is the potential difference of the parallel plate capacitor. So for example, let's just say, you know, you have your two plates hooked up to a nine volt battery. Well, that means your negative plate is zero volts, your positive plate is nine volts, so your delta V you would plug into this equation would be nine volts. And that's true of whatever battery you're using or whatever potential supply that you have. All right, well, we can do one more thing. We can now combine these two equations, the one from the previous slide and then this one here, to get a final version of these that does not depend on um, the area of the plates, how much charge is there. It just depends on how far into the plates you are based on how big of a potential difference there is between the two plate ends. So this is a useful equation if you don't know how much charge is on your plates or how big the plates are. This just says x over d, so where the charge is located, x, divided by the total distance of the two, d. And this has a really fascinating result. So I mean, again, if you have two plates, say positive and negative, and it's hooked up to a battery, um, say it's zero volts and nine volts. Right? So you have a nine volt difference between your two plates. Maybe I can make these two dimensional. These are plates. I uh, am not spending time trying to draw. And so if you wanted to figure out, like, for example, right in the middle what the potential diff or what the potential is, well, that's halfway between the plates. So you could put one half here of your total potential difference, and that would end up being 4.5. So it's just a ratio. If you're a quarter of the way into the plates, it would be a quarter of nine. Um, you know, if you're three quarters of the way, it'd be three quarters of nine and so on and so forth. So this is just showing you that linear increase as you step up from the negative to the positive plate. So to help you visualize this, let's go to the next slide. Here at the top, we see a graph of voltage with distance. Notice the linear change here. As you move in distance from zero to one to two to three millimeters, notice our voltage is gradually increasing at a constant rate. So this is just a visualization of that last equation saying that your voltage will increase at a constant rate. Here's another way to look at it. A 3D model of the two plates in gray on the left and the right hand side and then something in the middle, these little green sheet-like structures. Those are what we call equipotential surfaces. They're imaginary surfaces that have the same value of voltage at every single point. So everyone along, or everywhere along the left-hand green uh, sheet is uh, 0.5 volts. And then everywhere on the surface of the right-hand one is 1 volt. So this is just a three-dimensional way to imagine that increase. So um, the two points that you're seeing here uh, correspond to the two green surfaces you're looking at. So here, one millimeter into the plates, you have a voltage of 0.5. So everywhere, at, everywhere in here that is 0.5 millimeters away, so that's a distance of 0.5 millimeters, everything along there has a voltage of 0.5. Then you go another 0.5 uh, millimeters and you get to um, your one volt. Uh, oh, I have this, wait, where am I putting this? This is one millimeter, excuse me. Uh, I was looking at the units wrong. So this is one millimeter. So one millimeter away from your negative plate, you see a voltage of 0.5 volts. And then another millimeter further, 
right? So then two millimeters away from the negative plate, we see a one volt potential, right? So two millimeters away, one volt potential. So that's just a 3D way to imagine this idea. You can simplify it and put it back to two dimensions though, with the same exact kind of a diagram, except this time, instead of calling them equipotential surfaces, we call them equipotential lines, lines of equal potential. So everywhere along each of those green dashed lines, the potential is the same. 0.5 volts everywhere along the left-hand one and one along the right-hand one. All right, so uh, with this, uh, I have a video that I'd like you to watch. So uh, if you are just watching this on YouTube, I will include this link in the description of the video so that you can hopefully uh, check this out. It's just a video to help you kind of uh, visualize a lot of this content a little bit further. But for now, for our purposes, let's go ahead and work on an example. This is a more challenging one, I would say, uh, out of some of the ones we've seen recently. It says that a parallel plate capacitor's discs are spaced two millimeters apart and with a potential difference of 500 volts, as you can see on the right. A proton is shot through a hole in the negative plate at two times 10 to the five meters per second. What is the furthest distance from the negative plate that the proton reaches? So we're firing this proton in and it's going to be moving against the electric field. Well, this electric field is going to push on it and slow it down and try to cause it to stop. So we want to know how far into the plates it makes it before the electric field stops it. And that is our goal. Well, this is, you know, one of those problems where, you know, if you don't have any guidance or examples, it's really hard to figure out exactly where to start. I mean, sure, you can go uh, and look at a bunch of the formulas and pick out the one that seems like it'll work right. But, uh, you know, usually it helps to see an example like this first. And so that's the goal. This isn't a problem dealing with energy. So the first thing I would, I would do is start with our standard uh, conservation of energy equation from our previous lecture. Ooh, this ink is huge. Um, how do I make this smaller? Hang on one second. Um, hmm. Oh, well, uh, this might not work too well. Let's see if this does it. No. Okay, uh, sorry for that. I'm going to erase this. Okay, well, uh, I'll try to write lighter so it doesn't look as large. So, uh, in this case, we have our kinetic energy equation, K uh, final plus QV final. Sorry, it's K final plus QV final equals the initial terms, K initial plus Q V initial. So this is our standard conservation of energy equation for electric problems. So we have an interesting situation here where we can actually see that some of these values are gonna to go to zero. Zeros are our friend in this class. So anytime we can make something go to zero, that's going to help us a whole lot. First of all, recognize that this thing is being shot into the plates and then it's going to be stopped, right? It's going to stop at some certain distance, which means its final kinetic energy is zero because it is not moving once it stops, right? So there's no kinetic energy. But even further, this thing is starting at the negative plate where we define our potential to be zero. So initially at the negative plate, there is no potential, right? So I would write this here, but I think the ink is gonna look too bad. Uh, so V equals zero at the negative plate. This doesn't look too bad. I somehow must have turned on the sense turned up the sensitivity on how thick the ink is, but uh, anyways, and then this one goes to zero because it stops moving. 
So this is just, you know, us analyzing the motion or in the context of this particular problem. So the good news is if you recognize those things going to zero, it saves you some work because all that's left behind now is QV final equals K initial, which seems nice and innocent, but it gets worse again in a second. So let's expand this. First of all, understand that kinetic energy has its own equation, one half MV squared. On the left hand side, Notes that we do not know what the final potential is. We are given something related to potential. We're given a potential difference of 500 volts. That's not telling us specifically, necessarily, that one um, here is 500. Although it, it is, and we'll talk about that. So the way I tend to look at this is uh, to write this as the ratio. So we have Q times that equation that we just introduced, X over D times delta V. So again, this comes from our, our slide just on the last screen. Uh, it was the last equation we just introduced. Uh, it was two screens ago, but um, that'll help us. Because if you think about this, look at the equation as it was, there was no X in there, right? No, nothing for us to find a distance from. So our goal is to figure out our distance x, right? We want to know what x is. So we have to take this equation and rearrange it. One thing to note is to be careful with your v's. Note that this vi is speed. This delta v is potential difference. So maybe I'll add little hats or little arms to the v so that it's a little less confusing uh, when you get it in the mix with uh, speed. So we have to rearrange this for x. To do this, a little bit of algebra is necessary. First, recognize that we're going to say divide by q. Get that q underneath. Then we'll also have to divide by delta v. And then multiply everything by d. So the overall result will look something like the following mv squared times the d that we're multiplying by, all divided by 2 from the 1 half, uh, we'll say q delta v. Okay, so that was our algebra. Divide by q and delta v and multiply by d. Well, at this point, all we have to do is plug numbers in, although to be fair, it is a lot of them and they're pretty long numbers. The mass is not explicitly given to us, but we're told what the object is. It is a proton. So we need to plug in the mass of a proton, which is a standard 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Times the speed of that squared, that was 2 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Don't forget to square that quantity. And then times the distance between the plates, or the plate separation, which was given to us, let's see, as 2 millimeters. Milli is 10 to the minus 3. So this is 2 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. All that gets divided by 2 times the charge, which is also not given to us, but is the standard 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. That is the fundamental charge of every proton and electron. And then our potential difference is 500. So hopefully you can plug all this into your calculator correctly um, and you'll get something along the lines of 8.4 times 10 to the minus 4 meters. In other words, that would be uh, 0.84 millimeters. Now, here is something really helpful. Remember that when you get an answer, you should be asking yourself, does this value make sense? So let's ask us that, ourselves that same question. Does it make sense that we get a distance of 0.84 millimeters? Well, notice the separation of the two plates is 2 millimeters. So 0.84 is just a little bit less than halfway through there. So that does make sense. 
I mean, the only possible range of values we could have is something between 0 and 2. And we got 0.84. So that seems totally reasonable. Um, we don't, of course, know just from visualizing the problem exactly where in that range it would be, but at least it's within that range. And this allows us to uh, get our answer in that way and be hopefully more confident in it. Okay. Well, I included this slide here just as a summary, so this doesn't really, there's no new lecture material here. This is just a reference for you if you want to come back to all this material. On the right you have all the equations we introduced, and then on the left you have just a visual representation of what they're applied to. So this could be useful to you, perhaps, as a reference. Okay, that's the first half of the lecture, looking at the calculation of potential for a parallel plate capacitor. Now let's do the same thing for just regular point charges in space. So, first we'll start with potential energy. Let's say you have two like charges, Q and Q prime. They could be both positive or both negative. In this case, we're saying they're both positive. Well, we want to calculate the work needed to bring Q prime in from some distance to some distance r. So we're going to say, let's start all the way out at infinity. Because all the way out in, at infinity, the potential is zero, right? Because this will keep decreasing, this potential will keep decreasing, keep decreasing the further and further out you go, technically all the way to infinity. So let's start out there, where the electric potential energy is zero, an infinite distance away. We then move that charge closer and closer and closer to the other one. Well, think about what's going to happen. As you push these two guys together, their potential energy is going to increase. Think about uh, trying to compress a spring. If you take a spring and put it between your hands and you try to push it in, you can feel that energy stored up waiting to be released because if you let go, that spring pops back out into its original shape. So there's a lot of built up energy there. In other words, potential energy. Well, same thing here. Imagine trying to force two positive charges together, just like a spring. They want to be let go of and released and fly away from each other. So as you bring them closer and closer together, you're like compressing a spring, and so you're building up all this energy that's waiting to be used, which is by definition, potential energy. So as you move them closer and closer together, this graph is showing you the fact that that energy is going to increase the closer and closer they get. And I don't really derive this one for you, but it comes from that shape of the graph. The equation for calculating the electric potential energy of some pair of charges is the following. Your electric potential energy U is equal to K times the two charges, Q and Q prime, divided by R. Okay. So that is how we calculate electric potential energy of a point charge, or a pair of them, kqq over r. Okay. Now let's take this and figure out potential. Oh, uh, I forget, I threw in one extra slide just to talk about what happens if you have like charges versus opposite charges. So what we just saw was the situation of like charges, right? As you bring them closer together, it's like compressing a spring, energy is being built up and conserved, waiting to be used. So as a result, that energy has to go somewhere. So if you're increasing your potential energy, you must be decreasing your kinetic energy. So as you push this charge in toward the other one, it is gaining potential at the expense of kinetic. So what that means is it's going to slow down. And that should make sense. If you, say, give a push on a positive charge toward another one, they want to repel each other. So it's going to slow down, come to a stop, and then eventually turn around and start moving away. The opposite is true, though, if you have opposite charges, so one positive and one negative. In this case, your electric potential energy decreases. It's the complete opposite, right? It just decreases the closer they get together. So. This shows uh, the graph. It starts near zero when they're far away from each other at infinity. But then as you bring them closer and closer and closer together, you decrease your uh, potential energy um, in the way shown. So it's just uh, basically an inverse of the graph that you see above.
because it is the same property being applied in both cases. Well, this brings us to regular potential. We had an equation from a couple lectures ago that showed that potential V is simply stated as the amount of electric potential energy per unit charge. In other words, V is equal to U over Q prime. So if we have this kind of a equation, we can set it up as follows. V equals U over Q prime. Well, we just had an equation on the last slide for U, right? We said that was K Q Q prime over R. And then all of this is getting divided by Q prime. So what we see is the Q primes cancel out, simply leaving behind K Q over R. This is the equation for calculating the electric potential V of a point charge. And notice it only depends on the source charge Q, not Q prime. So it's the source charge that creates this potential in the space around it. And it decreases with distance. So that's why we're dividing by R here. As you, do, as you move further and further away, in other words, as you increase R, that means you're dividing by more and more, thus decreasing your potential. On the right-hand side, you see two diagrams, that of the electric field lines and equipotential lines of a positive and separately a negative charge. Remember, electric fields point away from positives and toward negatives, like shown. But what we haven't seen up until now is what those patterns look like for electric potential. They form concentric rings around your charge. As you can see, these little golden uh, yellowish orange rings, those are our equipotential lines. So, uh, you know, there's no saying how big each one is, but this could say, you know, be one volt. This outer one could be, what would that be, like five? You know, this one could be six. So everywhere along the outer ring is six volts. Everywhere on the second one is five volts and so on and so forth. So this just shows you visually what these equipotential lines look like. So with this, um, we have one more way to describe everything. We've said that potential is calculated using KQ over R. Well, Keep in mind, just like with any other situation we've dealt with, you could have more than one charge involved, which means you have to be able to do a sum of each of those values for the potential. So V1 plus V2 and so on. The good news here, for what it's worth, is that this is not a vector. It's just a number. So if you wanted to figure out how strong the potential is at one point, you just got to add them up. There isn't any complication with trig involved um, like you saw with some other examples because those were vectors. This is not. So, with this in mind, let's work on our first example using this material, the potential of a point charge. Looking at our diagram, we can see a few things. We see two charges, uh, which I suppose I will label, uh, let's call the charge negative 1 Q1 and the charge of 2 Q2. Keep it appropriate. And then we'll have to recognize that the point we're analyzing up here at the top is some distance, we'll call that R2 away. So the very first thing I would want to do is figure out what that distance R is so that when I get to all my equations in a moment, I don't have to worry about figuring out what that is in the middle of them. I'll have it ready. So let's figure out our distance R2. Well, in this case, we have two sides of the triangle already given to us. One is three centimeters and one is four. So you can just plug those straight in. Three centimeters quantity squared plus four centimeters uh, quantity squared. So in this case, it just shows that this is a three, four, five triangle. This ends up being five centimeters. Okay. Well, 
That's really all the preliminary work we had to do. We are now ready to try and solve this problem. Our electric potential, V, was told to us as being KQ over R. Let's be specific and say Q1 and R1. But that's not the only charge that's present. We have a second charge, K times Q2 over R2. So this is our setup. We could simplify this one more time if we would like. You do not have to do this. Uh, but you can pull out the factor of k in both to leave behind q1 over r1 plus uh, q2 over r2. So that simplifies everything in the sense that you wouldn't have to write k into your calculators twice. But admittedly, it probably took about the same amount of time to write this little bit of the equation, uh, you know, versus trying to uh, work the whole thing out. So anyways, we're ready to solve at this point. Uh, we do know the value of K, it's the constant, nine times 10 to the nine. We are given both charge values in the context of the problem, and we know how far away they are apart. So we are able to solve at this point. Uh, in this case, K, lowercase K is the constant. This is the nine times 10 to the nine meters per second, oh, not meters per second, excuse me, um, Newton meters squared per s Coulomb squared. Getting a little physics one mixed up in my head, uh, which I'm also teaching at the time, so it's confusing. Anyway, uh, this is Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. And then we have our charges over our distances. So this would be negative one times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs divided by 0 0.04 meters. Thus, we then have our Q2 and R2. Uh, this one was 2 times 10 to the minus uh, 9 divided by this one's distance, which was 5 centimeters, or 0 0.05. At this point, we are ready to solve. Plug this into your calculator. You should get about 140 volts. Now notice this doesn't have a direction. This is not a vector quantity, thankfully, so we avoided most of the math, and we don't even have to include a, a description of its angle or anything because it doesn't have one. By definition, this is a scalar, just a number. All right, well, with this, let's go ahead and conclude these complicated discussions with a couple, well, somewhat complicated questions. This one takes a little while. Uh, question number one, as a positive charge is moved from position I to position F, is its change in potential energy positive, negative, or zero? So note your answer options here are A, B, C, and D. So what this is saying is like, if your option was A, that means in the first example, top left, it should be zero change in electric potential energy, and so on and so forth. So take a minute to think about this one, and then return to the video once you are ready. Okay, well, first thing to note is we have to take the equation for this into account. Our potential energy equation uh, that we introduced was KQQ over R. All right, so this is the equation we just introduced for the uh, potential calculated of a point charge. So thinking about this, all we're really focused on in this problem is what's happening with the distance, right? Because um, we're not changing a constant, k, and the charges themselves, the values of them, are not changing either. So really, we're just focused on this being proportional to 1 over r. We don't care about any other stuff in this particular problem. So for the first one, you're starting a certain distance away, and then you end up over here. Well, those are the same distance apart. 
So the option here is that it must be zero. There's no um, significant uh, change in electric potential energy between these two points. But let's look at situation number two. Initially, we're close to the positive charge, and then we're further away from it. We are moving further away, so we're increasing the distance that we're dividing by. If you increase the distance you're dividing by, that means your potential is going to be decreasing. So final minus initial would thus be negative. Same thing for number three, but reversed. Notice now it's a negative charge, so everything reverses for negative charges. Here you're starting close and moving far away, but it's a negative charge, so that becomes positive. Two and three are basically the same thing. You're just swapping out one positive charge for one negative charge. And then four, not too complicated. You're taking your analysis at I and moving up to F. Well, the same distance between these two uh, is given, but it's bigger in distance than it was initially, right? Because initially we were only, you know, this leg away, but now we're the entire hypotenuse of this triangle as a distance away. So again, we're going to be seeing a decrease uh, in potential energy, so number four. Okay, next up. Two charges are separately brought into the vicinity of some fixed charge, cop, uh, capital Q. First, positive Q is brought to a point A, a distance R apart. Second, Q prime is, uh, or excuse me, second, Q is removed, and then Q prime is brought into the same point. What is the uh, electric potential at point A, which we'll call, you know, the point where they're at. So we'll call this point A. So we just have to think about what the difference is. We do everything the same. The only difference is one's positive, one's negative. Okay. Well, keep in mind uh, in this case that uh, this is only depending on the source charges. All right. This only depends on source charges. So we don't care what the charge Q or negative Q are doing or how strong they are or anything like that. What we care is, um, is um, what's going on with the source charges. So it's the same source charge in both cases. We're the same distance away. So in terms of the source charge, everything is the same. So the answer is C in this particular case. Everything is set up the same. The only difference is you're swapping out a positive for a negative charge as your test charge, but that's irrelevant. All right, last question, question three. Uh, this one's going to invoke the use of our potential energy equation again. So U equals KQQ over R. So it says a positive and a negative charge are released from rest in a vacuum. They move toward each other as shown. As they do, which of the following would be true? Okay. So think about what's happening in this equation. First of all, one is positive and one is negative. So when you multiply these together, we're going to get an overall negative. Potential. Okay, so we end up with a negative uh, potential energy. So that rules out options A and B, which say they become more or less positive. Now let's look. Um, oh, and this one says a positive potential energy becomes. Okay, so nope, we don't have a positive potential energy. So this narrows it down to C and D already. Now we have to differentiate between what um, is happening to it over time. So does it become more negative or less negative? Well, think about what these charges are doing. They are moving closer together. In other words, 
you are decreasing your distance r here, right? And that's in the denominator. So if you're decreasing your value of r, well, that means your overall value of u is going to increase and become more negative. The answer for this one is C. All right, guys, that's it for this lecture, lecture nine. We have one more lecture in this unit, being lecture 10, and then we'll, uh, if you're one of my students, we'll have a test, and then start our new unit, which is totally different from all this stuff. Uh, this gets us into this discussion of current uh, and how circuits work. So I love that material. I can't wait to share it with you. But until then, thanks for watching and have a great day.